Kama works as a law. I think it has a close analogy to conservation laws in material physics. We have laws in physics like conservation of angular momentum, which means if you've got a closed system and you perturb one part of it, then other parts will change their action to compensate to bring the system back into balance. I think angular momentum is the best analogy to Kama. You could use any of the physical conservation laws, but angular momentum is, seems to be a very neat analogy. Angular momentum means if you've got a closed system in motion, like the motion of planets orbiting a sun, you can measure the angular momentum, meaning the mass times the, uh, the velocity in the system and it's always going to be conserved. It's going to be the same. So if something changes in one part of the system, the other part will change to compensate and bring it back to the same value. In uh, physics textbooks, they often give a common example to demonstrate this is a figure skater who's twirling around with her arms out. And if she raises her arms over her head, then she'll speed up. And this is a, like a trick that they do. And that's conservation of angular momentum because with her arms out, some of the mass of her body is extended further. So it has a greater distance to travel. And then uh, that term of the equation is is changed when you lift your arms over your head now the the mass is all in the center so the other term the velocity has to increase to keep the the result the same so you perturb one part of a closed system something else will change to compensate and this seems to be right across the many different types of conservation of physical quantities that the universe seems to have a very strong tendency to right itself, to bring itself back to a zero point. You mess something up over here, something else will compensate over there. And kama is like that. It's like you're perturbing by your actions, which are done out of ignorance. Remember that you're conditioned by ignorance. Whatever, even you do good deeds, it's still based on ignorance, because it's not fully understanding. So you're kind of pushing something out of alignment in the universe. And it makes a little ripple. And then the universe compensates to bring itself back by giving you a resultant. If you do unskillful deeds, you'll get unskillful results. And skillful deeds, you get skillful results. This also depends on the principle that's uh, given at the very first verse of the Dhammapada, that mind is the forerunner, mind is the, the, the chief and the origin. Mind comes before body just as the ox comes before the cart. So what's done in the mind has an effect outside the mind because the mind is the primary factor. And this is a concept that is alien or uncomfortable to materialist thinking. But it's also one that's I think, gaining more and more acceptance in the, in, in the kind of intellectual mainstream. There's more serious thinkers that are proposing various kinds of idealist models. And it's also... Uh, a point of view that's quite compatible with modern physical 
conceptions, particularly the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, which is one of the ways that they try and explain the observer effect. It's discovered experimentally and can be expressed with mathematical precision that many physical effects at the micro level only are become real when they're observed. That a, a particle like a photon or an electron doesn't really have a precise location until it's measured. Prior to that, it only exists as a probability. So they talk about the probability wave. So you can express it as kind of a fuzzy area in space. The proton exists somewhere in this, in this range. And it only becomes a point location when it's observed. So the mind of the observer actually settles the wave function. And this idea of the wave function is very close to the idea of the void, the, or the, the full emptiness. The idea that everything exists only as a potential. And in the emptiness is universal potential. The sunyata emptiness is universal potential. It's infinite potentiality. And when things become manifest, when you have actual objects, discrete objects and events, then that's not an infinite potential anymore. It's a kind of a brokenness. This is dukkha. Anything in manifestation is kind of broken. Because it's lost its infinite potential, now it's only like a little shard. There's the uh, Sarvastivadin idea of the chitta, the knowing mind, as a single moment outside of time, which is the eternal present. And all the other events and objects in the universe are streaming, traveling backwards through time. They exist in the future as infinite potential. And as they move backwards and cross the threshold of the chitta, then they become discrete objects and are known, and then they fade back into the past. So when we make kama, we're acting out of ignorance and we're perturbing that process somehow. We're, we're shaping the universe with our thought, ultimately. So there's at least, a, at least a couple of levels in which we create the world we live in. One is through the perception, where we create a simulation of the world based on our sense organs. But the other deeper level is at the level of kama, where with our thought, we actually make kama and we create the resultants that we experience. In the Buddhist uh, cosmological model, kama often plays the role of what would be filled by a creator god in other systems. The new universe, when it comes into existence after the destruction of the old universe, is generated of the kama of the beings from before. So the, the act of creation becomes a kind of collective action that the uh, the accumulated kama of the beings require a theater for them to experience their resultants and a universe is generated and if we take the modern cosmological model of the big bang at the first moment after the singularity, 
there's a breaking of symmetry. This is one of the big philosophical questions of all time is why is there something instead of nothing? At the initial moment of the Big Bang, everything is streaming out equally from the center. How does it end up that the particles end up clumping into galaxies and stars and planets? There was some breaking of the symmetry. If the physical laws as we understand them were, were just so, there should just be a, a evenly distributed soup of particles. You know, there's, there was some unknown force causing a breaking of the symmetry. So because of ignorance formations, comma, and all things arise out of that. form conditioned objects are generated by ignorant minds pushing out into the dark and creating these partial forms, these fragments from the universal infinite potential. So there becomes something instead of nothing. And something is so much less than nothing ultimately.